right, good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, sorry we're starting a few minutes late. Uh, there's been a metro problem, uh, a fire of some sort, I guess. And so uh, no notion there's some people who are on their way still. But anyway, welcome to uh, Hudson Institute. I'm Charles Davidson, the executive director of the Kleptocracy Initiative. And here we are launching yet another of our reports. Uh, and I'll just mention to you that all the others are listed in the back on page 19, if you want a sense of, of uh, context. And they also should all be out on uh, a table outside in hard copy if you're interested. This uh, new one, Countering Russian Kleptocracy, uh, combines everything we've put out up until now and then also some new ideas. Uh, and uh, Ben Judah is going to uh, summarize and talk about the report, and then also his co-author Nate Sibley. And then we will go. Uh, we will have uh, uh, Jeff Gedman, who's sitting here, who will be a uh, respondent, and then also Clay Fuller from AEI. So uh, just to introduce the the, um, the 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 speakers briefly, Ben Judah, immediately to my right has been uh, working with the Kleptocracy Initiative half-time for quite a while now. Actually, he did some things early on. He was part of the bus tours in London that we initiated a few years ago, which are still going on, the Kleptocracy tours. Uh, and then he's, he's uh, written a uh, report that's out there that's a sort of anti-kleptocracy doctrine, and we've done a lot of other things. Uh, Nate Sibley is the program manager, immediately to Ben's right, of the Kleptocracy Initiative, and uh, uh, keeps everything going and does, um, well, does everything from co-authoring to writing uh, uh, and uh, compiling this daily brief that we put out, which I hope many of you are subscribed to. Uh, then to Nate's right, uh, Jeff Gedman has been part of the Kleptocracy Initiative from its inception as a member of its advisory council and has made all sorts of contributions to our efforts. Uh, he has been on many panels. He's been a brilliant respondent at least twice before this, I think, in events we've done, uh, et cetera. I'm sure some of you are familiar with his career. Uh, and uh, we have bios. I don't think we have time to go into too much of that, although some of you may know Jeff was president of RFERL uh, in Europe and, uh, and uh, ran the Legatum Institute, ran Aspen in Europe, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, oh, most importantly, he has written many, many pieces for my magazine, The American Interest. To his right, Clay Fuller, who is a, uh, at the American Enterprise Institute, and I like to joke that he's the, uh, one of the only people there who didn't go to Harvard. Uh, and uh, he has become very interested in anti-kleptocracy and the issue of uh, beneficial ownership and all sorts of things that, uh, that uh, we are interested in. So we're very happy to have Clay as an ally and an interested party. And Clay joined our advisory council last week and even invited us to lunch as a consequence. So we're very happy to, to have Clay on board. Now, that's all good news. There is uh, some rather sad news also that I just wanted to mention in passing, which is, um, as some of you may know, Karen Duisha passed away, the author of Putin's Kleptocracy. And she was an integral part of the Kleptocracy Initiative uh, until she fell very ill about a year ago. And uh, she will be much missed. Uh, she's had a, a huge influence on our government in terms of understanding the nature of the Putin regime and the, the threat that it poses to our society. So she will be sorely missed. And uh, Ben will also say a few words about her. But I thought I'd just uh, a, a quote very briefly, a very brief quote from uh, an article that she penned in the New York Times in 2014, and where she says, Russian capitalism depends on the Kremlin's closest circle marauding freely inside the country while safeguarding gains abroad. Russian oligarchs consume the public goods produced in the West, including the rule of law and a reliable investment climate, while maintaining vast networks of shell companies. 
their presence strengthens the worst aspects of our system and weakens the best. Uh, and then she mentions of Mr. Putin treating the West like an a la carte menu with public goods of his own choosing to be freely consumed. What he doesn't understand, however, is that the West is a prefix menu. Its values and obligations must be consumed along with its pleasures. Monsieur Judah? Well, uh, thank you all for, for coming uh, here today, and thank you again uh, to Charles and the, the Hudson Institute for making all of this uh, research uh, uh, possible. I, I'd like to begin uh, by saying a few words about um, Karen, de, Karen de Wiesha. And in the Jewish tradition, when we mention the names of the dead, we say, let their memory be a blessing, and never has this been truer than on her influence on our field of research, where it truly has been such a a blessing. And I truly feel that Karen Dewisha, through her scholarship, really revolutionized our understanding of what the Putin regime is, taking it conceptually from ideas of a failed democracy or a virtual democracy, and all from an authoritarian state, and correctly identifying it as a kleptocracy. What was Karen's breakthrough intellectually when she took this Approach, And I think in order to understand that and to understand where we are, we have to take ourselves back to the dominant view of economics, of globalization, or indeed of capitalism in the 1990s and in the 2000s. And there was a certain understanding that globalization and its dynamics only went one way. And I wouldn't want to do what people normally do in these discussions, which is to take a, a pot shot at Francis Fukuyama, but to actually show how widespread this consensus was from the hard, revolutionary-inspired um, left to the commentariat of the great liberal newspapers. On the left, if one takes uh, a classic of new neo-Marxist thinking, like Hart and Negri's empire, one sees the idea that there is only one dominant force in globalization, there's only one empire, as they would call it, which sends and radiates influence out one way from its capitals in London and in New York, uh, around America, and for a certain set of values that makes itself more uh, friendly to that vision of globalization. But from them, on the hard left, right to Martin Wolf's book, Why Globalization Works, all to Thomas Friedman's The Lexus and the Olive Tree, the same idea. These fundamental core processes of the world economy, of the flow of capital, are sending the influence of an American a European Union format of democratic society outwards. There's only one vector of influence. Now, what Karen did when looking at Russia and Russia's failure to conform with that theory, either from the left's perspective, by failing to sort of crumble or put itself in line, or by continuing to operate um, as uh, dis continuing to operate as a as in some ways uh, a competitor, all from the liberals' per perspective, a failure to conform with um, it, its supposed predestined path, was to look at what actually are the techniques and the motors of finance behind that. Theorists in the 90s and the 2000s like to talk about money in very broad, bush, vague ways. There are so many books with simply percentages of GDP, giant figures of flows of capital. But what techniques actually were there? And this was Karen's breakthrough to identify that behind the surface figures of globalization, you, we had had several revolutions in how money was organized and how money was placed, which were enabling the progressive emancipation of the super-rich from their states. The same techniques operating in China, in Russia, and the United States with, in some, with some similarities, but slightly different results. So what, what were those uh, techniques? Karen identified that the power of the Putin regime was drawing on techniques designed to serve the super-rich in the Western uh, economies anonymous companies, trusts, offshore, financial techniques that conferred anonymity and that enabled money to hide its, hide its owner's identity and to flow 
into zones where it was no longer under the sovereignty uh, of the state, into the tax havens of the Caribbean, into the sort of isles of, sort of Jersey and stuff, and other notional terrains where the old sovereignty of the state doesn't fully apply when it comes to tax or when it comes to unveiling identity. And Karen's research showed how these techniques had been used by the Putin regime to assemble a system, a system built of oligarchic power where around the Kremlin and some state institutions and other what we would call non-state actors or billionaires, webs of finance were operating that were the real location of the power of this, system, of this regime. And that was the real goal of this regime in order to keep the wheels turning. And these techniques, anonymity, offshore, was enabling the plundering of the Russian economy and unprecedented levels of corruption. These Western-enabled techniques was allowing the looting of Russia, but this money also had a destination. This was her next conceptual breakthrough, was that the money was going towards the West, and in exactly the same way that maybe early 1990s sort of millennium theorists viewed globalization as only being a one-way street of influence, that another way street of influence was uh, setting itself uh, up all the way through, the pre up until the election of uh, President Trump. These theories and these, these sort of conceptual breakthroughs were taking place very much in, in the university or in think tanks. And I think it's uh, important to remind ourselves just how dogmatic on the question of Russia that the uh, Obama administration was, where you had um, Secretary of State Kerry talking about how Russia belonged to the 19th century, or Obama talking about Russia sort of belonging to the sort of way pre things had previously been done, or being some sort of force that would be consigned to history. Again, it's that same thinking, that money only flows one way, influence only flows one way. Larger, dominant societies in the world economy will inevitably influence smaller ones and make them, uh, and make them uh, adapt to them or, or mimic them. All the time in parallel, there's no, there was not enough analysis of what Karen was showing, which is how in an atmosphere where these techniques to emancipate the super rich, anonymous companies, trusts, offshore, had created a situation where globalization was no longer fully under the control of what liberals would call the 1945 liberal order, what the left would call the empire, what uh, the, um, the right would call the correct logic of free markets, but had slipped slightly into a situation where trillions of dollars are now circulating the world anonymously, where trillions of dollars were building up in offshore and could then seamlessly flow back and forth, uh, ignoring previously established lines of sovereignty, ignoring the differences between East and West, between authoritarian states and democracies, and in a sense, beginning to blur them. One of the things that I find most interesting about the way people think in Washington, and perhaps this is a, a traditional American way of, of thinking, is the obsession with big numbers. It's the obsession with saying Russia has a smaller population than the United States. The United States has this many frigates. Russia has that many frigates. It's a concept of power that I believe is slightly outdated and doesn't quite acknowledge how these new networks of power can operate in the 21st century, which is even though Putin may have a smaller population at his, dispo uh, at his disposal, even though he can raise smaller armies boxed in by the existing order, he can assemble, thanks to these techniques, an incredibly powerful kleptocracy which can operate in a very fleet-footed manner ac across the 21st century, which can slip in through anonymous companies and offshore and make itself very present in London, in Washington, in Paris, or in Berlin. And I think that we need to try and conceive of this new dimension of competition or of struggle which is how 
the Putin's kleptocracy could escape and uh, dodge the borders where America has extremely strong defenses, the best air defenses in the world, the best navy in the world, the best army in the world, the most alliances in the world, and using anonymous uh, companies, using dark money, place itself right at the heart of um, the playing field in the uh, United States by using these techniques which were developed in order to liberate the uh, super rich from uh, American, uh, from in some ways from uh, American society. So where does this leave us? Uh, where does this leave us now in trying to um, conceptualize how to deal with uh, the Putin uh, regime? I think it's the first thing to say is there's still a lot of effort to be done in trying to explain this to people. In Britain, you still have large swathes of the left that cannot conceive of Russia uh, being an imperial power because it doesn't control the IMF. In the uh, US, you still have large swathes of centrist thinking that cannot conceive of Russia being a threat to American institutions because it has fewer tanks at its disposal. But over the last um, few months, I have felt there's really been uh, uh, there's really been a sort of breakthrough here in Washington in uh, conceiving of the Putin regime and its uh, vulnerabilities and a willingness to use financial sanctions to turn the weaknesses of the uh, Putin regime against it and to leverage the strength of the United States and of, the, of its European allies where those uh, I exist. And there's been... Uh, frequent incantation in sort of punditry and by columnists that uh, Russian money laundering and uh, Russian dark money must be made to, um, must be brought under control uh, in order to sort of strike back at uh, the Putin regime uh, internationally. So what we've done, sort of uh, Nate Sibley and I, is um, try and do something very, very different from this little bit spiel of theory that I've uh, delivered, which is to develop a policy checklist. Coming down from Olympus, what are the policies that are necessary in order to defend American sovereignty from this kleptocracy, in order to lock the door to that kleptocracy's presence and ability to play games in the United States and in US uh, allies? What are the techniques that we can use in order to stop this kleptocracy enriching itself and empowering itself for domestic and international uh, uh, action? And what can we do in order to reinforce existing and important institutions in the United States uh, and abroad in order to tackle this new 21st century, um, this new 21st century uh, threat, and what can we do in order to raise awareness of it in Russia uh, itself? I think I'm going to invite Nate to do the, uh, the sort of difficult task of explaining to you exactly how. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um We've had this sort of exhilarating political thought of Ben Judah. I'm going to sort of bore you to tears now by walking you through the, the sort of nuts and bolts of the report. Um, so first of all, it's, it's, as Ben said, it's not, you know, hinted at, it's not actually a rep re the, the, the title was carefully worded. It's not a report about the ins and outs of Russian kleptocracy itself. This is very much about um, a process of us identifying the sort of potential as well as the proven weaknesses uh, in the U.S. and the wider Western system. Um, that have been either exploited by Russia or have, you know, potentially have yet to be exploited by Russia. And what we've done is, um, in some cases, it's, you know, the idea was a policy checklist. Um, some of those might, might be more appropriate for a wish list. Um, but whatever, this was about throwing uh, policy ideas at the wall and seeing what sticks. Uh, so the first, um, you know, I see a few familiar faces. Uh, if you follow KI's work at all, the first and most powerful uh, a recommendation we have is, is the ending of anonymous companies uh, here in the US. Um, this, the, the centrality of this, this recommendation to all the others uh, and to US national security really can't be overstated. 
Um, what do we talk about when we talk about anonymous companies? Um, you also hear talk about uh, beneficial owner tr ownership transparency. What they're really talking about is shell companies. Um, and basically, anyone can incorporate uh, a company in the US without disclosing the identity uh, of who uh, actually owns or controls that company. Um, this, of course, makes it possible uh, for bad actors to move uh, illicit funds from uh, jurisdictions with poor sort of rule of law, dangerous jurisdictions uh, like Russia, for example, uh, through the international sort of networks, the offshore system, and into luxury uh, sort of value assets uh, in the US. Um, this, of course, has made it the number one sort of uh, vehicle for money laundering in the contemporary global economy. Bank robbers used to use getaway cars. Uh, they now use uh, shell companies, and uh, particularly US shell companies. Um, the US produces more of these com uh, companies every year than uh, the next 40 jurisdictions combined. So, you know, it's right to point the finger at traditional culprits like the Cayman Islands and the, the Channel Islands, but we also need to look uh, closer to home first before we do so. Um, there is movement on this. The UK uh, overseas, the UK has a beneficial ownership registry. The EU is also introducing one, uh, but the US currently has nothing on the on the books. Um, as even though, as I said, it's the world's biggest finance, essentially the world's biggest financial secrecy haven. Um, so, how does this relate to sort of Russian kleptocracy and the threat to us? Um, well, we basically we know that they've been uh, US shell companies have been used by Russian oligarchs uh, and Kremlin agents, whatever you want to call them. Um, the, the example that always gets willed out is. Poor old Victor Boot, the notorious arms dealer. He's now languishing in jail, but the problem is much more widespread than that. Um, that said, I don't want to go too much into sort of case studies. It's not what we're about in this report. And in any case, the, the worst case studies are almost certainly the ones we haven't heard about, because the whole point is these companies are secret and concealing uh, the very worst activity that's going on. Uh, just a nugget on that, on that front, though. Those of you who followed the Facebook uh, congressional hearings last week might have noticed that Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, who's been a great champion of uh, financial transparency in the context of national security in the US, asked Mark Zuckerberg uh, whether shell companies based in Delaware could be used by uh, Russian agents to uh, place, uh, purchase and place political advertisements on Facebook uh, without Facebook's uh, built-in detectors being able to tell what they were. Uh, Zuckerberg responded, yes, absolutely they could. Um, so that's a, you know, we don't, you know, without casting any aspersions whether they've been used to do that or not, that is a vulnerability. And, you know, if we're being proactive, uh, we need to address that rather than wait for it to happen next time around. Because if we're not paying attention, then the Russians certainly are. Um, again, so there is, it's not, it's not all doom and gloom. There is progress on this. There is enormous interest in this on the Hill at the moment. There are, I think, at the last count, six uh, bills in the House, uh, sorry, in, in, in Congress between the Senate and the House. Um, and there's another forthcoming. So if you're concerned about this issue, now is really the time to sort of read up on it and, and speak up about it. That said, we don't support any of those particular bills. We don't support particular legislation because we're a think tank. Uh, we, we just care about the policy behind them. Um, so basically, I, you know, I, if you take one thing away from this, it's that we need to end anonymous companies. If you want to defend your democracy, you have to clean up uh, your capitalism first. And this would be the first step towards doing that. Uh, the second step. Um, is also very important, um, uh, which it's titled in the, in the report, I think, Reforming the Foreign Agents Reg Registration Act. Uh, but the recommendation is actually slightly different from that. So this, for those of you who don't know, this is the law that requires lobbyists, PR firms, in some cases media firms, to uh, th those that are representing uh, the interests of foreign governments. They have to register with the de Department of Justice uh, uh, just to let the, the, the American public know that that's what they're doing. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's often presented as a kind of censorship or whatever by uh, people who don't like us. It's not what it is at all. It's simply a statement that we're being paid by the government of China or Russia. Um, that's where our money comes from, um, without saying anything about the content. Uh, those lobbyists uh, and PR companies working for foreign companies, uh, they register sort of as usual as a domestic company would under what's called the Lobbying Disclosure Act. So there's sort of two systems in, in circulation in, uh, here. And what we did in the report is we, you know, this is, issue has been looked at uh, with extraordinary detail by the Government uh, Accountability Office, by Organizations like the Project on Government Oversight have done a fantastic job of exposing, exposing the weaknesses, uh, the lack of enforcement, um, the lack of clarity for everyone involved. Um, so we've, we've settled that out, and we've, we've said these are the, if you want to go that route, these are the fixes you need to take. But our ultimate recommendation is actually just to, you know, this is just tinkering, basically, with a, a law that was brought in in the 1930s uh, to stop Nazis handing out pamphlets in Washington, D.C., basically. That's what we're kind of dealing with. You know, we now have much more sophisticated uh, influence campaigns. So our recommendation is 
this is a beltway problem. It's not like doing tax reform or health care reform. We, we should be able to just scrap these two laws, uh, archive the, archive the uh, online databases as they are, and just start from scratch with a new law that uh, better reflects the way that, or, or and not only better reflects the way that authoritarian influence campaigns work now, but also is easier for lobbyists to use. Um, no one enjoys using this, this system. Uh, it's, it's absolutely archaic. Uh, it doesn't capture the information it needs to, but it's also incredibly bureaucratic for uh, even honest lobbyists, if there are any of those around. Um, <laughs> so that would be our second uh, recommendation. Uh, the third uh, sort of links in with the first one, which is building a 21st century anti-money laundering system. As, as Ben mentioned in his previous report, which is about just this issue, and you can get a copy at the back, um, the, co the, the anti-money laundering system the US now has in place was introduced basically in the 1970s and hasn't been, it's had big updates, but it hasn't been fundamentally reformed since then. Um, and as Ben said, it was designed for catching cocaine cowboys, not Russian kleptocrats. Uh, obviously, the sort of way we perceive threats has changed a bit since then. Uh, the Treasury estimates about three, this is all despite the fact that the yes, Treasury estimates about $300 billion is laundered in the US annually, um, though money launderers currently face a less than 5% chance of conviction. This, again, is just a broken system that we need to, we need to rethink. Uh, as indicated earlier, lots of the problems we have here are to do with due diligence and stuff. Uh, the beneficial ownership secrecy, uh, the anonymous companies make that very difficult for banks' compliance departments, for the Treasury to sort of see behind the corporate veil. So if you introduce that reform, a lot of your anti-money laundering headaches would probably go away. But meanwhile, we need to think about what we need to do. We need to, bro very broadly and conceptually, in it, we need to shift from a sort of reporting base to an investigative regime. Um, you know, this is, very, this is very easily said. It's very complicated, of course, and it's... Uh, need a lot of new policies, a lot of innovation, a lot of new technology. Um, for example, the Clearinghouse, uh, I think about sort of 18 months ago, brought out a, a report which uh, opened a lot of eyes to, to lots of the problems. I don't agree with everything in it, but it was an example of the kind of innovation we need to sort out our anti-money laundering system. We also need to extend the system in, to include all the, the so-called sort of gate, gatekeeper professions uh, to the US financial system who aren't covered by it at the moment. Um, sort of lawyers, uh, realtors, uh, company formation agents, these sorts of people who work around the fringes, they're not part of the financial system directly, but they, have they should have responsibilities uh, to, to stop the inflow of dirty money. Um, the third thing that we, we recommend, which is often overlooked, is the, the EB-5 investor s scheme, um, which is, according to many, um, you know, lots of reporting that's been done, it's just completely sort of plagued by fraud and abuse at the moment. Um, this is, you know, to the extent that it's not only encouraging kleptocrats to move large sums of money into the U.S., uh, but it actually rewards them with residency and then citizenship for doing so. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with an investor scheme. It's good for jobs. It's good for the economy. But it does need to be properly policed, and that doesn't seem to be happening at the moment. Finally, we need to, you know, America, um, you know, I, I love it here, but I also notice that we tend to have sort of internal arguments. We don't look at what's going on around the rest of the world. There are some good policy ideas being brought forward, for example, in the UK um, that we should seek to draw on. Uh, unexplained wealth orders. You may have heard of those in the context of the recent sanctions and stuff. They're legally untested, but the, just having them on the books is, a, is an is incredibly powerful deterrent. These basically mean that if you turn up in a country with lots of money and it looks very suspicious to the authorities, they can demand that you provide proof of how you obtained it, or you could be subject to having it frozen and even seized. Um, that sounds incredibly draconian. Obviously, you need lots of safeguards in place. Uh, but having it on the books uh, is not something that we should immediately dismiss. Um, steps four to seven in our report, I'm going to sort of take these all at once because they, they move on from like, these three specific fixes we recommend to the US system uh, to more like of a focus on how to put anti-kleptocracy efforts on a sort of institutional footing that is commensurate with the, the scale of the threat we face. Um, rather than having the sort of piecemeal response that we, we seem to have adopted so far. So from the executive, and I did say this was a wish list, um, so I don't expect this to happen tomorrow, but we've said that we need a comprehensive counter-Russian kleptocracy strategy, which would, in fact, um, unlikely as it sounds given current politics and stuff, it would complement and expand on principles that are actually already very clearly set out in the national security strategy. Um, the executive also needs to provide law enforcement, intelligence agencies with the resources, uh, basically, whatever they need to hunt these Russian kleptocrats through the US and the global financial system. Um, they're pretty strained at the moment, is my, my understanding. Um, also, it's, it's failing, it needs to start fulfilling its um, 
sanctions and the other sort of many requirements under the, the Countering America's Adversaries Through uh, Sanctions Act, the Magnitsky uh, regime, uh, as well as making use of the Global Magnitsky Act, which is an incredibly powerful tool. Uh, and in the executive order for that, President Trump himself declared transnational corruption to be a national emergency. So there's no reason for them, you know, in his own words, not to act on this. Uh, second, uh, this is about how Congress would deal with this. We, do, we recommend the establishment of uh, a joint sort of uh, special committee or, and then followed up by working subcommittees. I, I see Paul is in the audience. He said to us that the, and he's quite right to say that the, um, <laughs> uh, Paul, Paul works at the Helsinki Commission, which has taken extraordinary leadership on uh, raising the issue of kleptocracy on the Hill. Um, and they are already a, for, a great forum for this. Um, we say that it should be ramped up to the next level um, uh, to sort of drive the legislative agenda and oversee things. Thirdly, and this is where we sort of move beyond the states, you know, once the states has done these things, at the moment it has no sort of, with no systems in place, there's really no, you can't go pointing fingers at other people if you haven't cleared your own backyard. With these systems in place, that gives America the sort of uh, moral and operational leadership it needs to go and start pressuring our allies, our partners, to do the same and starting to build a sort of global coalition against this problem. Um, so first we say the US should present the case for tackling kleptocracy, Russian kleptocracy at NATO. Uh, now, all the, we wanted to say that NATO should adopt it as one of its sort of core competencies. Everyone we spoke to said that's like absolutely zero chance of that happening. But what NATO, those conversations that NATO could do is provide the sort of framework, or the springboard, springboard for a sort of framework uh, that could be then used as sort of op operational sort of uh, working system uh, between our partners and allies. Uh, and we thought that a good model for this uh, was the uh, 2003 Proliferation Security Initiative, um, which we understand has been very successful. Uh, and we think that something probably similar could be, would be a very powerful way to, to start to operationalize efforts between our allies. Finally, just on, this, on, these, on these institutionalizing points, uh, we say that a special office should be established within the State Department uh, to analyze, report on, and counter uh, illicit, illicit Russian financial networks in Europe. Uh, it would work closely with our Euro par European partners to ensure that they also begin to institutionalize counter kleptocracy measures, as the US will have done by that point, uh, both internally, but also in their dealings with external parties, for example, through the Eastern Partnership. Um, this office should also you know, oversee the what it, and under Katzer and uh, this, this recent spending bill, I think Congress has now appropriated upwards of three, it's well over $300 million for fighting Russian influence in Europe now, and not a penny of it has been spent yet. Um, they should also you know, be making use of that money in a very aggressive way. Uh, step eight, the final step, which Ben, ben, ben mentioned, um, these relate to raising awareness. Once we've done all this, we've shored up our, we're on the moral high ground, we're able to deal with it operationally. Um, this should be about raising awareness of what we've done uh, within Russia. Um, the Russian people should be our most important ally in this fight. Um, they are the first and primary victims of Putin's kleptocracy. Um, to that end, you can expect if we bring in all these things that the, uh, the Department of Justice uh, Kleptocracy Asset Recovery Initiative will be taking in a lot more money from Russian kleptocrats who they're finally able to catch. Uh, this, we say this should be set aside in a special supervised fund for the Russian people. Let them know that the money is there, that we've identified it as having been stolen from them, and we're willing to return it to them uh, when Russia transitions uh, to the rule of law. Meanwhile, the US should begin, as, it's, as it was my understanding, it was required to under Katza, uh, should begin gathering, releasing information on illicit assets held by Russian officials, especially here in the US, but also in, more broadly in the West, uh, and promoting this in any way it can within Russia itself, where it can be expected to spread virally. Um, Finally, instead of becoming, uh, instead of being this sort of safe haven for illicit Russian funds that we've been to date, we should become a safe haven uh, for those who are willing to put themselves at risk uh, in revealing uh, the extent of uh, the Kremlin's corruption and the, th the threat it poses to the, to the US national interest. And by that, I mean, we should be expediting visas for whistleblowers, and we should, be, uh, we should find some way to incentivize their coming forward whether that's, a, a, you know, it sounds horrible, like a cut of the, the money that's recovered as a, re as a result of a, that can give them a comfortable life here and a lot safe and comfortable life here in the West. That would be one way to do it. Um, so that was a very quick whirlwind look through. There's a lot more policies in here, but it's also, as I said, we were throwing at the wall. This is really to open a conversation, uh, get the sort of policy ideas flowing, and we hope that you'll have lots more in the, that we've missed out. Thanks.
can you make the not such a brilliant uh, summary of the policy ideas? <laughs> well, well, just to, <laughs> it just, uh, <laughs> and just to re repeat again, um, it, if you look at the evolution of um, strategic thinking, in particular American strategic thinking, there's actually the idea that financial flows can in and of themselves be a source of insecurity or a source of threat or weaponized doesn't actually appear in American thinking until very late. This is not present in uh, US thinking in the early, mid, and it only begins to appear in the late um, 20th century. And again, it's very, unde it's very undeveloped, and it primarily exists in universities or in specific government departments in looking at uh, drugs, dr in looking at the influence and power of drugs money, it evolves out of the ideas uh, framing to frame the uh, so-called war on uh, drugs. Then you see the beginnings of a way of conceiving the world in terms of corruption in the 1990s, but it takes place quite far away and in very much intellectually in a separate room from American strategic national security uh, thinking. So what we're trying to show in not just in this report, but in all of the work that we do, is that financial flows in and of themselves can not only can be threats, but can very, very easily be weaponized by, host by kleptocracies hostile to the United States on a large scale, like Russia, but also on a much smaller scale, like Azerbaijan's influence campaigns in uh, Europe uh, and uh, beyond. And what this report is trying to show is that you can have a you can have the best the biggest wall in the world um, it, along the US uh, border you can have the most uh, ships in your navy you can have the best satellite defenses but if you don't have any defenses or any meaningful defenses when it comes to money when it comes to the entrance into the country of m money that can be weaponized you are leaving not only a door to the city open, you've only got three walls around it. There's a whole flank of the city which is not, uh, is not uh, walled off. So what we hope that uh, these policies can begin to show is how you can begin to build up that uh, wall against uh, corruption Thanks. for the United States, to use a bit of the lingo of our time. <laughs> Jeff? Charles, thank you. Um, <coughs> So first of all, to you, Charles, the kleptocracy initiative, um, uh, once again, what a phenomenal job. Uh, you changed the debate in important ways in Washington, and a uh, tip of hat to you. Great leadership, great work. And to Ben and Nate, it, it's a paper I commend to you. I've read it myself twice now. It is rich in detail, in ideas, in suggestions, and recommendations, and it's worth reading, and I hope you will uh, as soon as you can. I, I too, want to say something. Uh, briefly about Karen DeWisha and her very sad passing. Uh, to do what she did uh, takes academic rigor and industriousness and loads of integrity, uh, but also it's worth saying uh, a certain fearlessness. Th this is not for the faint of heart. And to do that kind of work with that kind of profile, uh, facing those kinds of adversaries and their proxies is no small matter at all. And so for many, many reasons, Charles, we're going to miss her. Um, and I want, to, I want to say that and tip my hat to her and to her memory. Uh, to the report at hand, uh, I have three things. I think, I think Clay and I decided on a division of labor. I'm going to talk about Russia, and he's going to take his four and a half minutes and talk about 192 countries or something like that. <laughs> um, but, but I'm going to close. But I'm going to talk about Russia, which is the subject of this report, and, and make three comments, if I may. Uh, the first is, it may sound self-evident, but sometimes it's useful to state the obvious. Uh, in the case of this problem and this paper, what's the problem we're trying to solve? And I do want to say that within the West and in this town, we are far more divided ever still than we ought to be. And like many of you, I go to endless dinner parties and conferences around Washington, DC, where we're not quite sure what Russia means under Vladimir Putin. To my bewilderment, but so it is. 
And like many of you, I go to endless dinner parties and conferences around this town <laughs> where we uh, speak endlessly about whether Vladimir Putin is a man of strategy or no, 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 he's just a mere tactician and opportunist, to which I say it's a completely wrong set of questions. And all I can tell you is after, what, 18, 19, nearly two decades in power, before tactics and strategy become, becomes vision, and we do know now, I mean, any reasonable person knows that he is a man of vision. Right? He has a vision for Europe and for our alliance, and that is a divided Europe, spheres of influence, a NATO and EU weaker, if not utterly emasculated, and the notion or proposition that he can build up a relatively weak Russia by cutting America down. I mean, I think the evidence is abundant, and I haven't heard anybody quarrel with that general hypothesis yet, but it's useful to focus on the issue, what problem are we trying to solve? It's the problem of Vladimir Putin's Russia, number one. Number two, uh, we in the United States and across the alliance, but we're here in Washington, D.C., across the uh, way from Trump Hotel, we in the United States need a strategy, and, and sanctions a strategy do not make. You know, stra a strategy has in mind goals, short and medium, long-term, and different elements. And I think one of the important contributions of the kleptocracy initiative in general, but Ben and Nate's paper is, that central to any meaningful, sensible, sustained strategy to attain the goals that we want to attain, kleptocracy ought to be central for a variety of reasons. And in my own shorthand, I would say, there's a lot of detail from this panel and this paper, it, it is, if you understand the nature and character of kleptocratic rule, it's the oxygen. It is the oxygen. This regime in Russia doesn't live without this kleptocratic behavior and its uh, methods of self-enrichment. And of course, Key alluded to and in the work of the Kleptocracy Initiative throughout our role as enablers, okay? And that's why we talk about anonymous companies and a number of the other recommendations in this fine paper. The fact is they are devious and they have malintent, and they are skillful at what they do in this Russian regime. But without us, it doesn't work, actually, as a matter of fact. And that's a very tough uh, issue and a number of the matter that comes up time and again. Third and last but not least, I want to say that in the paper itself, uh, of the many, many, many uh, uh, remarkable and useful recommendations and suggestions, um, uh, I applaud very much the idea of creating some sort of congressional body. I don't know what that looks like or what that form takes. Some in this audience know better than I. But, but to get more and greater congressional buy-in, to get more and greater congressional ownership, and to work us toward an area where we as Americans and in our national security strategy can work toward priorities. 37 things can be impor important but they cannot be all equally important, and we need ways and methods to not neglect a variety of things, but focus, because from priorities come allocation of time, political capital, and resources, and that's something we lack uh, to date. And then finally, you know, in, in the uh, many, many fabulous and important and compelling recommendations, uh, I think both Ben and both Nate alluded to it in their remarks, this idea of raising awareness in Russia, I think, is really very important. If we're enablers, as has been said, it's their country. They have stakes. They are, in a variety of ways, accomplice, participant, protagonist. And at the end of the day, I think, through a variety of means, and this is a medium to longer term element of a, of a larger strategy, I think Russians, including Russian nationalists, have to understand that Vladimir Putin is not a patriot of Russia. I think we in this room know this, and I think it'll take time to reveal itself in, in the right sort of circles in Russia. But at the end of the day, who can predict the future? But I'm going to predict the future, okay? When he is done, he will leave his country an empty shell because he is looting it. He's looting it financially, morally, spiritually, 
intellectually and culturally. And at the end of the day, he will leave this place gutted and as an empty shell. And anything we can do to curb, to contain, and ultimately end our enabling of this ghastly process and help Russians to understand that it is not just in our interest, they're not waking up every morning in Moscow to say, how can I make America great again? But it's actually in their interest as patriots to chart a new course, which is a different course than this deeply corrupt, self-dealing, kleptocratic rule is part and parcel of what they need to build a proper and, and great Russia. So that's my summary. Eager to hear your questions and, and eager to hear Clay I think touch on Russia, but he, he told me beforehand he wants to put this in a larger context because it's not about Russia alone. So Charles, I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, my name is Clay Fuller. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Kleptocracy initi Initiative for this uh, wonderful honor of joining the Advisory Council um, and to Ben and Nate for this report. Um, I'm new to DC, so this is sort of my first my first panel uh, out, outcoming. So um, I just graduated with my PhD. I wrote my dissertation on authoritarianism and corruption. I finished it last year. I know I timed it perfectly, right? <laughs> so, so in the aftermath, I figured I might as well come out to DC and sit in a tank and think for a little bit. <laughs> um, so I like the report because it highlights what I think are uh, some of the unconventional weaknesses to our national security strategy that don't get talked about uh, a lot in the uh, policy debates. Um, so I want to start out with sort of, I, I've written a lot on this beneficial ownership uh, issue in the registries and looking into it first, I just, with the, advent of the Panama leaks and the Paradise leaks, I just want to start out with a sort of a clear statement that bankers and businesses are not the enemies here. Um, I think we tend to see boogeymen around in shadows where they don't exist. We need to be careful about that because the success of businesses is part of what our comparative advantage is against the authoritarian kleptocratic threat. We need the large swelling compliance departments of our financial sector and of our business sector. We need them, they are our closest allies, they are our best friends, they are the strongest fighters against this in it. Now, similarly in the same strain, because it's more complex than just the money, immigrants, interest groups, and the media are not the enemy also, and we also need to recognize that because they make up the inner core of what democratic capitalism or liberal, liberal democracy, whatever you want to call it, is. And that is what our comparative advantage is in this fight against kleptocratic authoritarianism. So if you, if you look at current events going on today, and if you look at the national security strategy in its various forms and where it lists the different threats and the adversarial states, you see that we are entering interstate competition again, or great state competition, uh, reminiscent of the USSR or previous times before that, right? So I see as a scholar of authoritarianism within these reports, a common thread that runs through every single threat that the United States and Western governments face, and that is authoritarianism. Now, I've faced a lot of uh, pushback on some of my stuff I've written for the American Enterprise Institute on this because everybody wants to debate over how you measure democracy or authoritarianism or how you, how you define uh, each. So when I say authoritarian, what I mean is I mean where a small group of people, usually fronted by one man, takes over and has a monopoly of power over the entire political structure of the state. You have a small group funded by one person that controls the entire state. They have a monopoly on power. That is what authoritarianism is. This means it comes in many, many different forms, right? So you have the Communist Party dictatorships of China and of Cuba. You have theocracies like Iran. You have totalitarian states like North Korea. And increasingly, you have what we call in political science competitive authoritarian states like Russia, Egypt, Venezuela, these places where they hold nominally competitive elections, yet they tilt the scale so that they can make sure that they have a specific outcome. 
and usually at the expense of your individual liberties and your individual rights within, within those countries. Now, so from my view, I see all of these autocracies, authoritarian countries, are, are forms of kleptocracy. Because what happens is this small elite group that has a monopoly on power has to steal or skim off of the larger economy and off of the regular people who work there in order to support their monopoly on power at home. And they do it in very different ways. And so they're all different forms of kleptocracy. But this is where we need to leverage our comparative advantage because what every single one of these elite groups and every single one of these authoritarian regimes needs and wants in order to survive is access to the deep, liquid, and stable markets of the United States and Western governments. They have to have that access, and they want it. Why? Because here we have the independent rule of law. We respect individual privacy rights, property rights, civil liberties, all the things that make our economies prosperous and wealthy in the first place. They want to steal their money and put it here because they can use our own laws against us to grow it, spread it, use it to support their authoritarian rule at home. And I think one of the failings is that we have failed to recognize this. And looking at it, I see these authoritarians around the world just sort of laughing at us because we haven't noticed this yet. Right? Because of our respect for individual rights, liberties, privacy, all these things, this is why we're so wealthy. This is why the GDP per capita of, author of, of democratic states is usually three times that of the average in authoritarian states. This is why we have the most patents. This is why we have the strongest militaries, and on and on and on. Right? So to conclude, I think we need to recognize that businesses and banks are not the enemy. They are friends in this fight. The immigrants, the interest groups, the media are not the enemy. They are our friends in this fight. They support, they are, they, they are what liberal democracy is. And we need to leverage that comparative advantage against the kleptocratic authoritarians in this fight. And I have lots of specific things that I've written and talked about with beneficial ownership. I think updating FARA is a wonderful start with getting rid of the authoritarian influence that Ned has talked about with sharp power and other, other ways that authoritarians are using to break into democratic societies. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of different ways, and I like this report because it sort of starts bringing a, a more st strategic and wider whole of, whole of threat approach where we don't have to depend on missiles, bombs, and blood all the time. We can have a whole of threat approach to the adversary as long as we identify them correctly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you well, I'd, like, I'd like to invite the authors to respond to any of uh, Jeff's or Clay's comments that they would like to, if you want to, and, and then, uh, sure. yeah. Well, I think one of the interesting points about this uh, report, obviously Ru Russia is, is the major sort of geopolitical threat that we face at the moment. Um, we're also working on a report about China, by the way, in case you wanted to, to sort of quibble about that. Um, but in fact, sort of 90% of the recommendations in here uh, would apply equally to any klepto authoritarian kleptocracy around the world. Um, these, they all use the same systems. They all depend on the same access to our system. Uh, they use that for empowerment. Um, so when the time comes that uh, Equatorial Guinea, for example, is the next major strategic rival to the US, we can uh, rip the covers off, replace them, and get some poor intern to tip, start tipexing. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was written, you know, not intentionally. We set out to counter Russian kleptocracy, but we found that all the stuff that we had uh, looked at over the past two or three years in relation to any given kleptocracy found its way into here. Um, I'd just like to not to undermine my own theory, <laughs> but I'd like to also talk about how there are real <laughs> limits to the kleptocracy paradigm or, on Russia. And one of the things that um, I've been thinking about in in the last few months as we see a beginnings of a sanctions-based approach to Russia is the importance of continuing with anti-kleptocracy efforts even if it doesn't begin to change, even if it doesn't change uh, Russian behavior uh, because it's so important to clean up our, our own system and in order to sort of blunt kleptocratic influence uh, in, the, uh, in the West uh, itself. And I think that 
in terms of where research into Russia should go now, I think in possibly in the 2000s, I think there was too much emphasis on ideology, thinking, the influence of history on the Putin regime and the Putin cohort at the expense of financial and kleptocratic questions. And I think that now maybe uh, as the besieged fortress mentality builds, might be a good moment to sort of correct the balance slightly and to have a look at the uh, uh, some of the more sort of, ide- sort of non-financial ideological elements of that that thinking. Well, I think we've talked a lot. Uh, so far, what I think we'll do, since we have such a distinguished audience, is uh, is go to you and uh, take some questions or very short comments. And what we'll do is not do necessarily a classic Q&A, but we may take one of your questions and then sort of zing it around the panel uh, a little bit. So oh, I just need uh, you, as usual, to identify yourselves, uh, name and uh, organization. And um, let's see if we have any questions or, or comments. Sir. Herbert Reckenbogen, a professor of international relations and international law. In reference, reference to weaponizing the financial institutions and fiduciary issues, I would like to know how much has been reflected on what President Roosevelt did in the executive orders when he required that all citizens and all people living in the United States report all assets, and including also the uh, different owners of ben- beneficiary companies. These um, um, documents were um, destroyed in the early 1990s um, because they didn't have enough space in the archives. But my point is that Germany was using a tactic, just like Russia, to weaponize the financial institutions. And I've never heard any comparisons uh, in, this, uh, in this realm. Well, I think I'd like to talk to you about that afterwards. I think that's, uh, uh, I think that's a subject for further research and not quick-witted remarks. I wasn't aware of those. No, that's uh, really orders. fascinating. Um, I only moved here three years ago, so don't go back quite that far, but we'd love to yeah. learn more about that. No, no we'd, we'd love to talk to you about that afterwards, yeah. yeah. Terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Dimitri. Thank you very much for your comments. I think rightfully you talked a lot about what the United States should do, but I'm just wondering what's kind of happening on a global level as, as far as this, so it doesn't turn into kind of a whack-a-mole situation where if we do our part, they just shift wherever they can. I mean, I understand other people don't have the financial markets that we do, and so, but kind of more on a global level of countering where they're able to park their money. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, why don't we take that, that one because it's... Uh, Worth a little zinging around, yeah. So the, the, I mean, the point that, you know, you're quite right to say they probably will just start funneling money elsewhere. The problem is they're going to have to start funneling to places with, uh, that protect their assets less and less, uh, places with less and less rule of law. They're not getting what they want at the end of the day when, when that happens. Um, so I think it's worth doing that. And when, when that starts to happen, also remember, by, by shoring up our own defenses, we gain the sort of... Uh, the moral ability to go and start pressuring other countries to do the same. And gradually you sort of like, you build this network of fortresses where there's fewer and fewer places that haven't been pressured by the US uh, to sort out their own financial systems. So eventually, uh, my hope would be that, you know, the US is like basically cajoled or threatened everyone into, d- into implementing the same reforms that we recommend in here. And that there is actually just nowhere for this money to go and they have to keep it in their home countries and be accountable to their own populations. So we we have a policy proposal actually to deal with that. And, um, you know, sort of John Bolton is in the air and in the White House. And uh, um, John Bolton's great, one of his great achievements was the Proliferation Security Initiative established in 2003. And what he sought to do with the PSI was with NATO allies and trusted partners in order to establish a series of norms and agreements in order to limit nuclear proliferation, because he didn't want uh, there to be a US plus allies whack-a-mole situation. He wanted to spread this legally binding uh, structure as uh, far as uh, possible. He invested a lot of time and a lot of effort in it. It's one of those interesting sort of uh, 
uh, interesting things to, to talk about with Mr. Uh, Bolton. So what we are proposing is a global kleptocracy initiative modeled on the PSI, uh, which would require member states to endorse a statement of principles and adhere to an overarching strategy aimed at improving multilateral cooperation, domestic laws, and county counter-kleptocracy activities. So what the US could do would be to use this initiative in order to pressure, cajole, influence, coordinate the kind of techniques that are being developed here. So in terms <coughs> of coming down from the sort of Olympus of theory, which, which is nice in Chile, this is one of the, this I think will be a really effective uh, approach to dealing with the sort of global uh, level. And it's a framework that's worked before and uh, it's something that you could work with members of the administration on. Yeah. So very briefly, I would say it's about leadership and setting an example. We already have FATF out there that's doing a great job uh, uh, with this and wields a lot of power already. And so working through them would actually help that issue a lot. Um, I, I would just add, Charles, that um, so, so good that, Ben, you mentioned John Bolton. Uh, he's a Russia hawk. Let's hope he will clarify the, the thinking and stiffen the resolve of his sometimes volatile and unpredictable boss. Um, he is also a man who understands uh, the, the nature of a whack-a-mole problem. And part of the solution to that is, and this is what you just alluded to in your report, uh, you have to play defense, but any strategy has to play offense, too. And it's not just us tactically responding, but it's an uh, uh, integrated effort in putting him and them on their back heel. And I, I don't know if, Anders, you're going to speak to this. You raised your hand. But you've thought a lot about how one can work with allies and drive up the cost, make it harder, and at least reduce the opportunity for them to redirect. So whatever you ask or say, I hope you'll comment on that, too. Anders? We have a mic. Yes, Katarina. Under yeah. Oslund Atlantic Council, and uh, once again, I want to congratulate uh, uh, the Kleptocracy uh, Initiative and the office to this. Uh, I think this is very important. And but when one gets a report like this, one immediately asks, what is not there, and what should be there? What additional points? And I would come up with uh, two uh, things in particular. Well, first, I should say I very much like that you are focusing on the U.S. because I think the U.S. and the U.K. are the two big problems. Mm -hmm. My guess would be that 80% of hidden Russian money is in these two countries. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we should try to focus rather than internationalize. And um, on the US, what is missing? Freedom of information. Uh, reporters without Borden currently ranks the US on the 30, 43rd place in terms of uh, uh, press freedom. And there are three big problems. It's little freedom of information. It's uh, plenty of gag orders that any kind of legal authority can issue far more here than I think in any other country. And then thirdly, libel. And then we come to the courts, that uh, the kleptocrats habitually use courts to sue everybody or rather threaten people so that they can't uh, publish. I mean, Karen Dawisha's uh, book is a, is a good example. It's still not published or available in the UK, but it's also yeah. difficult in, in this uh, uh, country. And if you have somebody who's suf uh, sufficiently wealthy, and these people are sufficiently very wealthy, they can always win in court mm -hmm. in one way or the other because the cost for you becomes so high, so you, so you uh, uh, give up. And uh, the Fraser Institute now ranks the US in, on the 38th place in terms of rule of law, which is very much because of this uh, uh, unequal access uh, to a legal defense. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, sir? Yeah, Thanks, Charles. Paul Massaro with the Helsinki Commission. Um, you know, I hope that the Helsinki Commission, thanks, Nate, for the shout out, can be at least the precursor, perhaps the uh, anti kleptocracy uh, committee in Congress. Um, but a quick question for y'all. Um, thanks so much for this report. 
Uh, I could sit around here and talk all day about these recommendations and what's missing, and thank you, Dr. Oslin, for those thoughts. Um, but I have a question in that I wonder, how do we expect the kleptocrats to fight back? I mean, say we start implementing this stuff, we get beneficial ownership transparency passed. Well, we passed the Magnitsky Act, right? And then the Russians banned adoptions. That was the way they fought back to that. Could see, I don't know, something much worse than that when we start throwing money out of the country. Um, all sorts of stuff. That's, this could be taken as a real aggravated assault uh, on Russia, seeing as, you know, Russia's defining itself right now as Putin and its and his cronies. So um, I think that we should be thinking about it, and I'd love your thoughts on this, but, you know, what we expect to be the reactions of these kleptocracies, Russia, China, et cetera, and how we can be ready to counter the counterattack. Just, yeah, just to sort of, uh, well, this comes to what I was talking about as the limits of uh, a kleptocracy paradigm in terms of influencing uh, or changing Russian behavior. So a purely kleptocracy paradigm would assume that a that once you begin to impose these sanctions and these carrots and sticks and you begin to block access to the West for Russian kleptocrats, that they will modify their behavior in order to preserve their access to these um, preserve their access to these markets to continue the same dynamic of uh, uh, of, of enrichment. Now, whereas I think that's partly true, I think that recent uh, events in Moscow show that there's another dynamic at play, which is that globally focused oligarchs and kleptocrats, their assets can be challenged or eaten up by perhaps financially less ambitious, more domestic security forces backed or linked uh, 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 sort of local kleptocrats. So I think there's definitely a limit to our influence to change the Russian system from within. What we're talking about here is how to limit the Russian system's influence on us and ways to limit the dynamic of money laundering, which is empowering certain actors within uh, the Russian Federation. Something that I think is very interesting, and again, uh, I think it's very important to pay attention to what Russian leaders say. And they actually speak quite a lot about their ideas of the international situation. I don't think we have paid enough attention to essays, speeches, and articles by Petrushev or by Sokov in the recent moment as they begin to try and flesh out a, a vision of themselves as this sort of isolated uh, fortress. In terms of techniques that they have themselves spoken about, of what would they do if the sanctions dynamics uh, continue? Well, there's, uh, when you discuss this with people who speak to them or people who are part of their orbit, uh, or, they, or they've even said in public they would try and substitute US deep market access with Chinese deep market access. So we often talk about ripping Russia out of SWIFT. That's ripping Russia out of the global payment system. Um, well, first thing, we don't really know what would happen if we did that, just in terms of you know, the sort of ripples and the algorithms. And we're not sure what that would do to the financial system, like just to have so many products, so many forms of exchange, so many flights uh, placed in that challenge. But Russia said it would switch to China Union Pay. Now, it could do that, but could it do that if the US had placed dollar sanctions on access to SWIFT? So you might end up in a situation where someone using China Union Pay wouldn't want a Russian client because that would stop China Union Pay using dollars. So there are various ways you could do that. That's one thing that they have mentioned. You again hear from them that, well, we can substitute Western banks for Chinese banks. Well, to a certain extent, you could do that. They don't have, as Clay well, was reminding us, the same de depth of uh, financing available. In terms of other hybrid techniques that Russian officials have said, and I think it's, again, or Russians that are not officials but have the influence of officials, like Mr. Kostin, the head of VTB. Well, there have been mentions of various hybrid responses, various acts of hybrid warfare that they could use to what, in a sense, correctly, they see as our hybrid warfare, going through sanctions and so forth. So one military demonstration they have made with submarines over, uh, over the fiber optic cables in the Atlantic or around the Channel is that they could potentially damage or cut fiber optic cables 
that the city of London or New York use for high-speed velocity trading? It would be a very elegant response in, if you're thinking from a Putin hybrid warfare point of view. So that's one format of response they can do. We're already seeing that there appears to have been a cyber attack response to uh, the um, a cyber attack response to the limited and quite theatrical strikes that took place in Syria and the threat of new sanctions. So um, I think it's uh, in terms of other responses we've seen, one which interestingly hasn't been threatened, but I don't actually think it is vi a viable hybrid response for the Russian Federation, is turning off the gas or oil, which would literally leave Russia completely bankrupt. I refuse to, now my sources of finance have been thrown into question by you, I now destroy my last remaining source of finance. I don't think that's actually a viable option there. But I think we need to, we need to think a lot more in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of the hybridity of kind of warfare and contestation and struggle in the, in the international system and be prepared for all the very out of the boxes uh, re responses. And, you know, just to come back to it, you know, there are large and lengthy speeches and essays, a lot of them are very verbose, some of them are quite good, mostly verbose though, by Russian government officials on this. One potential sanction I didn't mention, be interesting to know whether we think that's theater or not, is that Kostin, the head of VTB, said that if his bank was sanctioned, which is on the cards as a response to the Syrian death machine that Russia and Iran have enabled, he could conceive of this as being an act of war that would result in the Russian ambassador being withdrawn from Washington. Well, that's one, uh, yeah, it was just, this is the kind of, so one thing we know that they would do is that they would do uh, a dramatic rhetorical escalation, and perhaps potentially there might be some questions of ambassadors or diplomats being withdrawn in that situation. In terms of just something that's interesting to imagine. So imagine that all of the, every conceivable financial sanction is placed on Russia. And uh, well, where do we end up? It's kind of interesting theoretical to be in. And what does that tell us about the global order? So if we look at Rusal, if we look at the Rusal shares, Deripaska gets sanctioned, part of, an anti part of the anti-kleptocracy policy paradigm. And we see Rusal, we see the shares of Rusal collapse. Just a complete collapse of the value, the accumulated value of this company. We now see Rusal being threatened with, with serious questions of how it's going to be able to sell its aluminium. So one thing I think we can conclude there is actually the state remains the most powerful actor in globalization. Amazon couldn't destroy Rusal. Facebook couldn't destroy Rusal. Only the US government with the dollar, the power of the dollar, could do that. And if Britain or China had done similar sanctions to Rusal, they wouldn't have been affected because they'd not backed by that dollar stop uh, threat. So I think that's very interesting. I think a question uh, going, I think a question beyond that would be, so imagine we have all of these oligarchs, all of these companies under those levels of sanctions. Now a lot of it, I think how, what would happen next would be really is the realm of pure politics in which we could sketch out an optimistic scenario we should sketch out a pessimistic scenario. And obviously, if I was doing this in the context of the DOD or the State Department or the White House, I'd like to do all of them five times. In a pessimistic scenario, these levels of sanctions would, would they don't actually, even in a pessimistic scenario, because these levels of sanctions don't actually stop, banking sanctions don't actually stop Russian companies or the Kremlin in its broader network from being a natural resource producer, and stop them selling oil, and stop them selling gas, and stop us needing oil or needing gas, they are still able to primitively accumulate on a certain level. So decision making within that collective oligarchy or kleptocracy would be limit your ambitions, you know, limit your ambitions, ride this out. People who were dreaming big can be eaten up or, or thrown overboard by more nationalistic local, you know, sort of uh, FSB-backed guys. We need, maybe, we need, maybe a decision by Putin would be to change who are the custodians of this capital, who are the custodians 
of this natural resource wealth. We might see people like Deripaska shuffled away, or in terms of the scale of their access to it, in favor of more people from the security services that could ally to him. That's a pessimistic scenario in which you have a sanctioned authoritarian Russia, which might actually become more autocratic and more authoritarian. You know, we would have limited uh, leverage over what goes on inside. They would have basically no access to capital from outside. They'd be very, there would be next to no incentive uh, for them to conform to any of our uh, standards for their own domestic financial management because, well, the only capital they could get from China or from elsewhere. So that's a pessimistic scenario. An optimistic scenario, and again, it's just politics. We don't know what would happen, is the, um, the nature of, we have a very, very, we have quite a basic understanding of democracy or a dictatorship, when actually it's obviously, uh, a, it's obviously a continuum. And the, the thing in that continuum, once you've passed over, elections being faked and so on, within the nature of a dictatorship, is how much negotiation is there within a regime. And since 2011, we have seen a diminution of the amount of negotiation that can take place within the Russian regime with different actors with Vladimir Putin. Previously, from 2000 to about 2011, there was a much higher amount of negotiation in which different part players and partners could go, no, I don't agree with that, I think we should go here, a lot more debate. And an optimistic scenario would be that these kind of sanctions would re-inject negotiation into that, um, re-inject negotiation into that, uh, into, that, into that kleptocracy, that Kremlin, that oligarchy. Mm. So what, let's say, and I think we should assume a pessimistic outcome. So what do you then do? And I think that we don't sketch this, out, sketch this out in this report because we feel that we are at a moment of crisis in which we're so far away from that and we're so far away from even a viable response, we wouldn't need to do that. But once that's all done, you do need, I believe, to develop a very, very clear flip side of it. You need to develop an off-ramp, very, very clearly signposted what Russia, what this regime is not going to change. We don't want to change it, because we don't know what would happen afterwards, can do in order to reintegrate itself. So one of the things that Sulkov uh, said recently in his recent essay, he's alluding to the fact that, if you take the Jackson Van Eyck uh, Amendment, once US sanctions are imposed, they, you, they can't be removed. And I think that if we were going to go the full way, we would need to establish a very, very clear return ramp clearly establishing what they would have to do in order for those sanctions to be removed. Get very, very, very clear linkage in order to encourage negotiation and encourage people to want to come back. Well, that's, uh, Paul uh, Massaro, Mr. Massaro has brought up a very fundamental question. It sounds like that could be a whole study on our part. Maybe that's our <laughs> yeah, next that's job. Right. Yeah, that could be it. No, I've been thinking about it. And it, got, it got a long answer, a very yeah. eloquent, interesting answer. Oh, very, sort of the, the outline of, uh, of something. Very simply, Paul, how, how I would answer it is they would behave in the way any common criminal would. So they're going to avoid and find new ways to move around. And so you're right. It's, it's going to be a constant struggle, just as the rule of law and democracy and law enforcement is a constant struggle also. But I have faith in our law enforcement institutions to be able to follow that and track it and go with it. But they need the sort of legislative authorizations to do uh, what they what they need to do uh, uh, ahead of that and on the the note of uh, I would slightly disagree with uh, the notion of the difference between democracies and and autocracies it's a very simple way to do this if you if you take uh, a hundred people in the United States and you ask them who controls America you're likely to get about 80 to 100 different answers Right. If you go to Russia, even in 2000 or 2018, and ask 100 Russians who controls Russia, you're going to get one of two answers. Right. If you go to China and you ask 100 Chinese who runs China, you're going to get one of two answers, the party or the leader. That's how you tell the difference between a democracy and an autocracy. And of course, there is variation within negotiating within it, and that can be leveraged in different ways. And there is 
variation, and you're completely right uh, uh, about that. But there is a clear way to distinguish uh, between the two. Jeff, did you want to make a comment on this before I'll we move on? OK, we have a question in the uh, front row here, please. Yeah? And lady here. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Valeria Yegisman. I'm from Estonia, and I currently work with the uh, Free Rush Foundation. Um, thank you for a very interesting discussion. So my question, I have actually two questions, may I? Uh, so my first question is, uh, how strong is a political will to actually counter Russian kleptocracy, whether in the US or in the uh, UK, to actually implement these measures uh, that you recommend? or to actively use the existing tools like um, unexplained uh, wealth orders in the UK. And my second question is about raising awareness in Russia. So I think it is extremely important that the US uh, publicize the data about uh, kleptocrats and their assets. But in a situation with enormous uh, propaganda in Russia and state-controlled TV, and in a situation when um, a lot of even personal sanctions are portrayed as economic sanctions against Russia, etc. So uh, do you have any kind of recommendations how to raise awareness in Russia on kleptocrats for ordinary Russians? So uh, ordinary Russians would know, critical mass would know this information, but not everyone outside Russia. Thank you. Just answer the second one first is, um, if, I, if I ran a think tank and if I had uh, nefarious ambitions, I would get the people who work for me to basically create numbers because I'm fascinated by the power that zombie stats have over our debate. And there are certain figures, maybe you can think of them now, 70% of the EU, all laws in Britain are made in the EU, or Vladimir Putin steals 55 billion a year, that we're never really sure where they come from. But these numbers get lodged in our minds and they get repeated and repeated and reproduced and reproduced by the rapid by, by the media in a Wikipedia age. So one thing that I think would be very useful to do is to create numbers so people can conceptualize what the scale of this kleptocracy is. It's very difficult because of questions of anonymity, so on and so forth. So our recommendation is that a foundation, a fund for the Russian people, and like I said, that one for every country, you know, in, in, in this problem, where all of the assets would be placed, all assets that have been seized would be placed. And I like that I think that the amount in that would then become a figure that would circulate within Russia. Oh my God, did you know there's 50 billion of stolen money uh, sitting for the Russian people in a fund? It doesn't have to be administered by the US. It can be administered by an inter-Western, inter-EU-US you know, sort of uh, body or something. And I would like to just, it would be you know, ideal for there just to be a website where you could click on it and see how much money was in it. And every time assets would, seize, would be seized, it would, go, it would go up. So that's one technique. I'm not interested in propaganda. That's not my, my job. If I was interested in propaganda, you, know, you could maybe create another website where you could create some sort of algorithm that wouldn't actually be scientific to calculate how much money Russia was losing in the way that uh, some money that Russia was losing. One report that I think that someone should do and I think, again, it's like the power of numbers, is that we have a very vague debate about the crimes of Putin. Everybody knows he's doing very bad, a lot of very bad things. But when you, you see people on TV, they're very hard to pre press to tell you, to, give, to put numbers on that crime. People go, well, he's very corrupt, he kills journalists, he's done terrible things in Syria, and he creates refugees, and he, re he jails the opposition. But I think it would be a very influential report to put numbers on all of those. How many refugees? How many journalists? How many uh, jailed uh, opposition activists? I think it would be quite surprising. I think if you started to tabulate the amount of refugees caused by direct Russian military engagement from Ukraine with Syria, with, um, with Chechnya, that would raise a question of present or past refugees. The figure would really become huge. And in terms of how many journalists, I think even though you know, as a journalist, something that I'm horrified by and alarmed by, the figures would actually be much smaller than Turkey or uh, than, than, say, Turkey, with, the amount, with, with its scandalous uh, rate of jailing journalists. So those are some ideas. So I would, I would respond very briefly to the one 
um, we have the means, we have RFERL, we have Voice of America, we have BBC, we have Deutsche Welle, and I just augment what Ben said by saying that a lot of this stuff is of the long game. I mean, it really takes time, and mm -hmm. some of it requires high quality, deep research and investigative reporting because it's vivid and compelling and ultimately resonates. By the way, I would include in all of this our enabling Western mole because it's an important part. It's truth telling and it builds our credibility inside Russia. Mm -hmm. The other point, your first point, um, I think simply it's not a great moment. You, you know about Western resolve and Western unity. It's not here in the United States. It's not in Britain because Britain is so consumed by Brexit, 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 and so forth. But I think that the lesson of history is that, that when alliances and nations get stuck, and I'm going to suggest we're stuck right now, the lesson is you keep playing. You keep playing and you keep fighting until the circumstances change. But acknowledge that for a variety of reasons, including here, if I may say, including with this president, it's not the ideal moment for focus on these issues in a way we care. So we keep playing and fighting. At the same time, we've had extraordinary levels of interest uh, in our work from the Hill in the past year. Um, this was written not to order, but in, de in response to uh, an awful lot of demand uh, from lots of officers, lots of officers that you wouldn't think of as being concerned about <laughs> this issue. I'm not going to obviously divulge who they are. Uh, but they, they want a list of policies that they can take to their boss as they say, uh, this is what we do about Russia. Um, so whether that translates to political will, and, you know, you judge it by outcomes, not by interest. Um, that's not for a think tank to, to say. We're just there to put out the wish list, and they can pick and choose as they want. I think it's fair to say we, we, we see growing political will in terms of the demand there is for anti-kleptocracy uh, more broadly, and um, including in the UK. I mean, we, there's actually a very uh, robust opposition to uh, kleptocratic influence in the UK. Ben Judah's been very much a part of that, for that matter. Uh, so it's not, uh, it, the, 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 the uh, bad guys haven't won by any stretch of the imagination. Clay had a little comment, and then I'm afraid we'll have to uh, conclude there, but we'll be around if any of us, any of you want to en engage us uh, after the official end of the event. I would just say very shortly to this, to this last uh, comment on bringing it to the Russian people. It's not propaganda when you promote process. It's education. Um, when you promote a specific outcome, like the Russians have done, that is propaganda. And so one of the solutions, I think, is, is doubling, increasing the budgets for VOA, RF, RFLE, um, all of these in order to promote democratic process and promote democratic norms, promote our values, our institutions to the world and, and strengthen them. Because that's not propaganda, that's education. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you.